Our theme this morning is thinking and acting like a champion. So what do those words mean to you? I'd just like to hear some, uh, some quick responses. Thinking and acting like a champion. What comes to mind when you hear that? Is it a, a person, a team, an organization? What do you think of? Thinking and acting like a champion. Yes, ma'am. Customer service, okay. Who else? Yes, sir. Employee engagement, great. Anything else? I'm sorry? Individual excellence, great. Well, I think of the Ohio State Buckeyes. Are there any football fans in here? Any college football fans? Any Ohio State fans? Oh, O-H-I-O, there we go. So, so, uh, <laughs> So, so I'm an Ohio State psycho fan, okay? I live in Arkansas, but I'm a psycho Ohio State fan. I spend, I waste a lot of time uh, on their 11 Warrior website, look, looking at Urban Meyer press conferences and things like that. But one thing that, that I have really started thinking about is how athletic teams and companies build excellence. And, and it comes through thinking and acting like a champion and then building systems around thinking and acting like a champion. So systems for recruiting, systems for practice, systems for conditioning, systems for strengthening, systems for uh, pre-game uh, film study, systems for handling the game, right? So there are systems involved in thinking and acting like a champion. And in this first presentation, and in the whole day, we're gonna talk about systems and processes that champions utilize to become champions. And so I am a process consultant. So that means that uh, I look at, at ways credit unions do things and I push them and I say, can we do better? I've learned this over here. Maybe you could put this into your credit union. So the first presentation is about management systems or leadership systems that champions use. And that's why I call it high velocity. So uh, as an analytics uh, leader for 25 years in banks, I started out first building some functional expertise as an analyst. But then when I became a manager, I realized that my main job was leading and influencing people. And I had to build systems to do that. Then when I started my consulting firm, I began talking to credit union CEOs all over the country. And so you can see a lot of the articles I've written about credit union CEOs on my website, ceovelocity.com. If you subscribe to Credit Union Business Magazine or Credit Union Management, you'll see some of those, those articles. But what I've been able to do in this presentation is fuse together my own management systems experience and what leading credit union experts around the, or CEOs around the country do. And that's what we're gonna to deliver today. So you'll be able to, to leave here and go back to your boards and your executive teams, and you'll be able to say, okay, now here are some processes for analyzing leadership, people, systems, analytics, and how can we apply these at our credit union? So really, this is sort of the, the amalgamation of, of what you've learned this week. Everything you've learned, the wonderful presentations that you've heard, you'll be able to put into these systems that I'm going to show you. And, and stop me if you have questions. I will say there's a lot of information in this first presentation, more than you can absorb in an hour. So just know that going into it, but you, I've given you my cards. Feel free to reach out to me if you have questions, okay? So here's our agenda today. We're gonna to talk about velocity, what it is, why it's important. We'll define it, uh, what are its components, how it can get off track or reduced, and then we'll, we'll spend a lot of time here on velocity through leadership and people. We'll kind of go through systems fairly quickly because it's kind of a segue into the next presentation. But just remember, any John Maxwell leadership fans here? John Maxwell says everything rises and falls on leadership, so we're gonna spend a lot of time on leadership systems today because that is the most important thing. So let's start out with a definition 
what in fact is velocity? Well, it's the rate at which your credit union is traveling toward its goals. And it's comprised really of, of direction and speed. Okay, direction and speed. If you ha have solid goals uh, that really drive your employees and are crystal clear, and if you've given them the systems and the training to achieve those goals, it's going to be a great place to work. You'll be an employer of choice. And that's what we all want. So uh, it determines whether or not you hit your objectives and when you hit them. And because of that, I contend that it's the number one metric that you should be evaluating your CEO and your executive team on. Velocity. Because if, if you're struggling to reach your goals or if you don't know what your goals are, I mean, isn't that what your management team is supposed to do? And so you're going to get the tools here today to support them, to support your management team, to coach them, and to hold them accountable. This is not uh, something that you need to uh, do yourself in terms of operations. I had uh, some directors ask me that in a, in a previous presentation. This is, I'm giving you tools to help you build your credit union, to help your leaders move the credit union forward with high velocity. So velocity contains three components. And we'll talk about them uh, each today. And you'll notice they're integrated. Leadership, people, and systems. And they have to work together like a championship team. And so what we'll do in this presentation is even though they have to work together, we're going to take each one of them separately and do a little process analysis on them. And I'll give you some of the best practices, like I said, of, of credit union CEOs around the country. So what are some sample functions of each of these components, leadership, people, and systems? Well, there, there are myriad, right? I've just given you a sample here. So leadership creates values, mission, strategy, culture, communication. In other words, direction. Leadership creates direction. People and systems create speed, efficiency, effectiveness. So for people, we've got member care. Uh, they've got to execute on the strategy. They've got to uh, have solid operations, smooth operations, uh, get feedback from members and give the feedback to leadership. They've got to develop themselves and they've got to innovate. Those are just a few of the things uh, that employees do. Systems. By systems, I mean, I can, it can be technology systems, but I also mean ways that you do things, processes. So you, you have a, an IT process, the way they evaluate technology and the way they uh, bring new technology in, the way they prioritize their technology investments. You've got human resources has systems, ways in which they go about hiring people and, and onboarding them and on and on. Today we're going to talk about, just as an example, a strategic marketing system. And it's just an example of how to think through a system that people can use and which is a, is a leadership tool to help all these three work together for velocity. So it's important to remember leadership sets direction, people and systems create speed, efficiency, and effectiveness. And they all go hand in hand. So what are some ways that velocity can get off track? Well, there, there really are, are, are several. You just keep remembering that diagram of those three circles. So the first one is, I see this, um, I'd say this is the most common. It's where you have strong leadership and people, but the systems that you use inside the credit union are inadequate. They're not allowing people to get their jobs done like they would want to. So what I see a lot of times, there are, there are numerous complaints that I hear about core systems providers. And I hear a lot of credit unions wanting to swap out, change out their core system provider. Why? Because it's not letting them get the job done and it's frustrating. It's, it's prohibiting them from going as fast toward their goals as they would like. The other thing I see sometimes is strong leadership in systems, but weak people. And this comes in companies that uh, really aren't focused on developing people, developing talent. They're just there to fill a role 
and get a check, and if they quit, we'll get somebody else. These are companies that, that are not really engaged very much in training and development. So that leads to lost opportunities because you've got employees on the front line and in call centers who aren't able to serve members as well as, as they should be. This is the second uh, highest one that I see, and that is strong people and systems, but, but weak leadership. And this can come when leadership has too many, the strategy is too broad, or if they're within, let's say, five years or so, or 10, or they've been in their job a long time, and, and they're not really pushing forward and growing. I sometimes... I've heard the term that they're, they're checked out. They're retired, but they're still there. And that can be very frustrating and create a sense of hopelessness for employees because no matter what I do as an employee and no matter what kind of systems we, we engage in our credit union, our management is still not going to buy in. There's still inertia there. So that can be really frustrating. These are three primary velocity, uh, what I call inhibitors or reducers. So let's just drill a little bit more into that. So the first one has to do with, with strategy. So I said sometimes the strategy is too broad, it's unclear, it's we want to be everything to everybody, and sometimes there's not real unity on the executive team in terms of the strategy. So if I manage mortgage, if you're the CFO, if, if you're the head of uh, the branch division, we're all going our separate ways and we're not unified around a common strategy. I see that quite often. And so that really slows a credit union down in terms of achieving its goals and, and, and providing clear direction for its employees. I'll go through these quickly. Uh, sometimes you can have members who are unaware of all the products and services that you offer. That's very common. And so them not being aware of how you can help them slows down your progress. Let's talk about strategic partners. So you all have, uh, in your credit unions, you all have technology partners, all kinds of vendors that serve you. And chances are very good that you are not using those external partners to the greatest extent of their ability to serve you. So something that I like to do is bring in my external partners once a year and say, what, how am I not using you to the fullest extent that I can? So I've bought a particular piece of technology from you. How am I underusing it? How are other credit unions using it better than me? And then once we're off of that, by the way, what other products do you have that I'm not using and I should know about? And then finally, what are other credit unions and banks around the country doing that, that you see that I haven't even thought of? So something like that is leveraging your external partners. And right now, when you're in budgeting season, when you're in strategic planning season here in the fall, this is a great time to be doing this before you make your final decisions. And finally, this is a kind of a lead-in information to our next presentation, Analytics. But I'll just kind of whet your, whet your appetite a little bit and say, Information that's in your, your systems is a gold mine. And for many credit unions, it's untapped. You've got process information, credit information, uh, where people on their mortgage applications that told you where they bank. You've got all kinds of patterns and trends that are just waiting there for you to use them, for someone in your credit union to use them and to help you uh, go develop new processes and go quicker. Questions so far? Everything clear? All right, so now we're going to talk about velocity through leadership. And so just remember that we're always talking about these three circles here. So the next probably uh, six or seven roughly uh, slides, we're going to be talking about leadership, a leadership system designed to create clarity and, uh, and direction so that the employees know where they're going, and, and we can build systems that will get us in that direction. So we're going to follow this little outline here. I call it the six guiding forces of credit union growth and success. 
And the first two have to do with what I would call the playing field, lining everybody up with the same playbook. So we're, we're creating a field of play. On a football field, we've got end zones, and we've got sidelines. And, and so that's what the first two are about, alignment. And I'll give you a framework for alignment. Then we're going to talk about communication. So communication, super critical. I mean, have you ever worked in a company where you felt like you were the last person to know what was going on? Because there, uh, it's, it's just commonplace that communication, particularly as organizations grow, kind of falters. And if you don't have a defined communication process, things can get off track. You can't go as fast as you want to go. Then we'll talk about selecting and developing leaders. And then we'll follow up by, by looking at a low overhead, um, keeping overhead expenses low, which enables us to invest more uh, in technology and people and go at a faster rate. This is the most important slide that you're going to see all day. If I could just talk to you for an hour about this slide, I would. It's called the Eight Pillars of Strategic Alignment. And I mentioned the playing field. This sets your playing field. On the right-hand side, we have strategy. On the left-hand side, we have communication. And at the very top, we have knowing who you are, your core values, your brand promise, your mission, your vision, your goals, which never change. Those are fixed in stone. They're what distinguishes you from your competitors. And at the bottom, you've got communication, which is the glue that holds these together. So you all, as senior leaders and, and board members, have everything to do with this. This is how you define your credit union and, and what you want to achieve. So you're super involved in, in setting your core values. And those have to emanate, disseminate throughout your entire organization. People have to, to play by those rules. And then you build your strategy around it. Strategies change depending on market conditions, interest rate environment, unemployment, lots of things. And then, of course, uh, you, you take that strategy and utilize it to, for member needs. And analytics is a tool that you can utilize to uncover various member needs because you've got a lot of different kinds of, of people that are your members. It's not one size fits all, as you may have heard this week. So different members have different needs. And then you want to create a particular kind of member experience for those various member needs. And this is how you stay relevant. This is how you stay tuned in with your marketplace. This is how you keep growing because you've got these things in mind and you've got systems developed that enable you to constantly understand changing member needs and changing member demands. But it all has to be analyzed and, and, and created within the context of who you are uniquely in your market. Then, of course, we'll talk about communication. And then employees have to have focus when they execute. Remember the very beginning, in those three circles, I said one of the elements, one of the components that employees are responsible for is execution. And if they have to be executing on your strategy and on member needs and on member experience on important things and eliminate things that don't correlate back to your strategy. And then, of course, we measure. How did we do? And we take everything that we did, we analyze it, and we say, okay, let's innovate. How can we do better? And then you'll have a bunch of great ideas, and you'll have to take those ideas and see if we, if we utilize the, the, those ideas, how do they correspond with our core values? So you see, it's a circle. It's, it's a continuous loop. So this is very important. I'll refer back to it, but this is your playing field. Next, we're talking about communication. This is the third element of those six guiding forces, the strategic glue. And this is a model that one particular CEO uses of a very large credit union. And notice that he's communicating with various groups of people, all the employees, and he's got uh, town hall meetings 
which occur several times a year for each branch, weekly emails, open door policy, and so he's communicating with all employees, showing them continually that he's engaged, and he told me that communicating the, the strategy, the mission, why they're doing things is his main message. He communicates that to his board, employees, uh, his senior leaders all the time. But the key thing that I want you to, to take away from this slide is that he has a system, a defined system of communication. Remember, we're, we're thinking and acting like champions. And so this is how champions do it. This, this comes from the CEO of the third largest credit union in the country. And so very disciplined guy and, uh, and very structured and, and intentional about his communication. Communication is a huge part of his job. This is a three-pronged approach to choosing leaders. And, and this is interesting because notice that functional expertise comes last. First comes people skills. And, and why is that? People skills so important. John Maxwell sell, says leadership is, is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. So your ability to influence people and to work with them, to understand them, like you all have said, discussed with the getting the employee feedback, is, is paramount to be able to get them on board, to get buy-in, and get them moving, get them to understand your clear direction, and then uh, being able to, to help them move efficiently and effectively and speedily. So here's a, a leadership uh, selection model that, that chooses leaders, first and foremost, based on their people skills. Second of all, it, cho it chooses leaders based on their conceptual abilities. Their abilities to, to think about market conditions in my particular community, whether it's uh, Tennessee or, or Provo, Utah, or, or Hawaii, what's going on in my marketplace from an employment perspective, from an economic perspective, are people moving in, moving out, are there universities? What's the trend that's occurring? What do I expect to happen over the next five to 10 years? in my locality, as well as in the financial services industry. What are FinTech companies doing? What new products am I going to have to, what new mortgage products am I gonna to have to create? So conceptual thinking. And then lastly comes my functional expertise. How well do I know the, know the mortgage business? How well do I know finance? How well do I know uh, the branch network and how to operate branches. That comes last because lots of people have the functional expertise. But you really start weeding people out when you're looking at people skills and conceptual thinking with respect to your culture. So you're looking for these people, remember, let's keep in mind the playing field, those eight pillars of strategic uh, alignment. And we're, we're finding leaders that fit that, who we are, what are our core values, and are they able to influence people along those lines and communicate with them and think about our culture, what we want to be, how do we want to stay unique, but keep moving, right? So that helps build clarity, your ability to choose leaders with people skills, conceptual thinking, and functional expertise. How many of you in this room know that your credit union has a, a formal leadership development model. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, quite a few, that's excellent. So oftentimes this is neglected and I'm glad to see that many in the room have this. So here's a leadership a development model that, that doesn't assume that once somebody becomes an executive, they're done, they're fully baked. It assumes that they have to keep growing, that they've got a lot more potential left. So at this credit union, they have leadership development at, at three levels. And in the VP and above, they put them into classes. So uh, a class could be two, five, 10, 20, depending on the size of your credit union. And there are, there are two things. One, we wanna teach them the technical skills. So how do we innovate? 
What's technology doing? How do we create a strategic plan? How do we budget? But then there are other things like how do we lead within our culture? How do we absorb our, our core values into what we're thinking? How do we keep all these various leaders with, with different unique skill sets aligned on that playing field of the eight pillars? And so this is a way that, that this credit union does that, achieves that alignment of their leadership. Because even though I'm, I'm a CFO or uh, the head of the mortgage division, and we have different job duties, we're still aligned around the same culture and strategy. That's something that's paramount in this leadership development model. They're also given personal coaches. So they'll do this for a year, and each one will have a personal coach. And I've known several leaders, uh, who several CEOs who started out, they said, you know, no, I've got more in me. Who, who's from Amplify Credit Union here? Okay, I know your CEO, Paul Trilko. He and I met, I wrote an article on him. And uh, he told me that he had a personal coach. He, when they were about 100 million, he said, you know, I think I've got more in me, but I need some help. He got a coach and it helped him and he extended that to his executive team, helped them, and then he started extending it, build a, a leadership development model like this for all of his managers. And so why do we go down here to member-facing employees? Because, like I said, leadership is not necessarily tied to the position. You don't have to have the title of branch manager or VP of anything to be a leader. You can be a role model as a new accounts person, as a call center person, right? You've got people in your credit union, your top quarter percent, top performers that you talked about, who don't have the title, but they're leaders, right? People look up to them because they're doing things the right way. So we want to always be, be ex extending development opportunities to people throughout the organization. So what are the benefits of this type of structured leadership development? Well, I think there, there are, are quite a few, but I've really encapsulated them into four words. They give clarity, focus, consistency, and strength. And that's what we're trying to do with leadership. When we talk about velocity, when we talk about leadership being able to set clear direction, this brief model that I've given you here does that. And so uh, I like, I'll just go through a, a few of these, but you get continuity of culture and values while moving forward and being a, a, a modern credit union. You can adopt modern principles without changing your core values. And so that's what this does. I also like interdepartmental communication and collaboration focused on the same initiatives. Haven't you guys worked in organizations where you were going crossways with each other? And I mean, I know I was very dependent on the IT area. And I had my strategic initiatives. The IT department had their strategic initiatives. And oftentimes, they did not correspond to each other. So my primary initiative might be their 101st initiative. And that became very, very frustrating, right? So you have to either go through the back door, through somebody that you know, or, or bloody your knuckles going through the front door, or just wait. So this gets everybody on the same page. And I want to wrap up this uh, leadership model that produces velocity by a low overhead approach to drive innovation. What we're trying to do here, once again, we're creating a, a flow that continues where we want to drive down the acquisition costs for assets, for deposits, and growth. And we want to take the extra money that that saves us and invest it in talent and technology and innovation to understand member needs that provide better experiences and increase member uh, the number of members and sales. You heard a presentation on on digital. Uh, uh, help me out with the with the uh, the name of it. Uh, digital. Well, how technology, uh, the digital age, how credit unions can adopt di digital technology, right? And so that's what this is about. 
This is about holding down your costs, your, your asset, your member acquisition cost to invest in member experience primarily as we move forward through, through digital technology and the talent that you need to drive that. All right, remember that velocity comes from leadership, people, and systems. So next we're going to talk about people. And we're going to go a little bit faster through this because the, the leadership part of it was the most important. So there really are six components here that we want to talk about. Job performance and uh, focusing on strengths, high value actions, overhauling processes, incentives, and unleashing thought leaders. And when we get to unleashing thought leaders, that will go to some of the comments that we heard earlier about the feedback process. So focusing on strengths. Everybody in here probably at one point in their career has had an, uh, a, a performance review, right? Employee performance review. And so oftentimes employee performance reviews go something like this. Scott, you did great on three things. You're just awesome at these three things. Uh, you're kind of middle of the road on this one thing, and you're just not very good on these other three. And so I really want you to focus on, uh, th in this coming year, I want you to get a lot better on the three things that you're not very good at. And so what does Scott do? Scott works really hard on the things that, that he's not good at. And, and he gets training and gets a little better and maybe gets up to average. And that's the maximum uh, that, that Scott will ever get to. But what happens in the meantime? What is Scott not doing? Working on my, on my top three, right? And so you can see how that inhibits velocity because I'm not working on what I'm super good at. I'm working on what I got a spanking on during my performance evaluation. Then I'm holding the credit union back with my job performance. And so why don't we restructure our jobs based on employee strengths? The thing that comes to mind for me is uh, basketball. So you've got, there are generally are two guards on, on the court at the same time. Well, even though they have the same position, they've got different strengths. So one guard might be great at, at uh, ball handling and passing. The other guard might be great at shooting and scoring. And they get, even though they play the same position, they get evaluated differently. So I would suggest to you, uh, this, is, this is hard management, right? It takes time. It takes a lot of time. Uh, and it, it requires being engaged in the people development process. Find out what your employees are good at, really good at. And align their jobs and evaluate them based on their skills. It doesn't mean you can't train them, provide them some additional training on, on where they're deficient, but understand their strengths. And there's, there's a very important survey that's done by the Gallup organization probably every two years. It's called the, uh, the Gallup Survey of the American Workforce. Have you heard of that? If you haven't, you've got to read it. Gallup Survey on the American Workforce. And one of the things that says that employees want the most is they want to be engaged in what they do best most of the time. So spend time asking them, what do they want to do? What do they think they do best? And you can, there are some great assessment tools. One of them is called Strength Finder by Gallup. Another one is called MCOR. And, and I highly recommend just focusing on strengths. So within the context of strengths, we're going to talk about identifying high value actions. So just because I'm good at something doesn't mean I'm doing it the best way. There might be a way I could still be good at it, but cut the time in half. So, uh, and I might be doing some things that really aren't uh, effectively helping the credit union move forward, right? So, uh, so what I frequently have done when I've taught branch managers, as I've said, okay, list the 10 things that take up most of your time. And you can do this with any position. 10 things that take up most of your time. Now, tell me which of those things help your branch grow the most. And invariably, it's two or three things. So then what we have to do is, is say, okay, now let's figure out how to spend more of your time on those two or three things. 
and it can be automating the other seven, outsourcing, or eliminating. I spent a lot of time at my last job during 16 years constantly evaluating what we were doing and whether or not it was adding value to the organization. And if it wasn't, I got rid of it. Found a way to get rid of it. So, so my employees focused on what added the most value. And that's what I mean here by focusing on high value activities. So we're talking about employees and velocity and how they could be faster, more efficient. And so eliminating stuff that doesn't correspond back to your strategy, back to the playing field, the eight pillars we talked about, that does them a lot of good and it does your credit union a lot of good. So overhauling processes is, is a big one. So uh, in that low overhead slide that we had, that's overhauling processes. That's what that is about. And always looking at what you're doing, uh, questioning what you're doing. And this can be tough, right? Because some of your processes are old or outdated. And I love this quote here by a CEO down in San Antonio Examining everything we do and determining whether it's a best practice for the future takes a tremendous amount of work and engagement with the staff. It's a lot of work. And there's resistance when you change things. We've always done it this way, so why are we changing it now? It's always worked. And it's particularly upsetting when it's your upper level management that's the, those the ones who are resisting. That's tough. And that's where you, as directors, have to be challenging them. So change can hurt, but it's the only way to stay relevant in, in the changing marketplace, the changing financial marketplace. So you can ex expect resistance. I certainly have had a lot of resistance to my ideas, but it, you can never do it alone. You always have to get support, find early adopters, and pretty soon it, it uh, It'll take hold if you're patient and persistent. But it's hard work. Thinking and acting like a champion is hard work. Aligning your incentives with your goals and your mission. So are you, are you at the front line, for example? Are, you, is your, are your incentives based on how many accounts you open, what kind of products they are, etc.? Or are people's incentives and are, are aligned around what matters to the credit union? What matters to members? And, and I love what this uh, CEO from California, Donna Bland, said. Is there a process to validate that the goals the business unit has set, the business unit has set, so the call center, the mortgage operation, the branches, the credit union as a whole, is there a way to validate that the goals that they've set correspond to the overall corporate goals? So if I'm the call center manager, the goals that I have correspond to the credit union's goals overall. And do I take those goals then and incent my employees accordingly? That's the message that we're trying to, to convey here. You want to, remember we're talking about velocity, this little box here, employees. So we want to incent them to move forward and effectively are on things that matter, on, on high value activities that correspond to their strengths. So here's, here's the, the slide on unleashing your credit union's thought leaders. And this is taking your top performers cross-functionally, uh, let's say about eight to 10, and focusing them on a topic. It could be fee income, it could be member experience, it could be any of a number of topics. What new products we need, uh, and, and focus them on one important goal, one important strategic initiative that you have, cross-functionally. And let them meet weekly for six to eight weeks. Give them boundaries, right? You've got the eight pillars of strategic alignment and implement their ideas and reward them. So here's a, a CEO, Joe Newberry, from Huntsville, Alabama. And I really like his thinking. He's way out of the box. We've got all areas thinking about how they can be profit centers instead of being an expense to the organization. So he's got his HR team, his training team, 
going out in his local community and, and businesses are paying his training team money to train them. And he's doing the same thing with his IT team. That's out of the box. It came from employee innovation. So here's a little exercise you can use. 25 ideas innovation exercise. When you get this innovation group together, have them come up with 25 ideas to solve the problem. And it might not be all at once. They might get the first 10, have to go home, cook, uh, sleep on it, play golf, cook dinner, whatever. But it's going to start percolating, and they're going to come up with the next. They're going to put ideas together, and then they come up with 25. Then they evaluate them, come up with the top five, run them past the senior management team and the board, and you're going to get some good ideas. So this is a, a way for that employee feedback, one way anyway. The last element is systems thinking. Over here in this, in this uh, circle. And as an example of systems, we're going to use strategic marketing, and that's a segue into the next presentation, which is why I'm going to go fast through it. Uh, but, but this could be your, your loan underwriting system. It could be your budgeting system. It could be your hiring and onboarding system. It could be the way in which you acquire uh, new members and, and onboard them. It could have to do with employee performance. It could have to do with compliance. The main thing that I want you to get from this is how to take apart a process and ask your management team to take apart a process for you. What are the key elements for approving loans? What are the key elements for employee engagement? What are the key elements for credit quality? And have them create a diagram like this. And then go through each of them and say, OK, how can we do each of these better? And how are these helping our employees use the systems to drive the credit union forward? And is there any part of the system that is misaligned with our direction? So for example, Brand promise, That's, that should be part of your core values. Who do you want to serve? How do you want to change uh, their lives? Is it small business? Is it single moms? Is it people coming out of the military? And, and, do, and the and key is, do your employees know this? Is this well communicated throughout your credit union? Can everybody recite it? And is everybody motivated by it? Next, this, this, like I said, comes back into the next presentation. Are we using data and analytics strategically? And just a couple things I want to talk about here is 80% of financial services executives don't believe their, their uh, credit union or their bank should be data-driven. That's an obstacle. So uh, what you want to do is get data from all your systems, whether it comes from loans, human resources, members, anything. You want to get the data, assemble it, and, and what's key here is uh, the, the executive team and the CEO have to be informed and become advocates about your different uh, systems, and in this case, particularly data and analytics. So, once you get your data from your systems, whether it's employee performance, whether it's compliance, whatever it happens to be, you put it into categories that are understandable and alignable. And so here, what I've done is I've arranged members into what I call profitability groups. We'll talk about this a little more in the next presentation. But the key that I want you to get here in terms of analyzing systems is you're taking data whether it's compliance data or whatever, and you're putting it into manageable buckets so you can analyze it and then turn it into some understanding, some insights. So in this case, we're understanding members and their needs. And key is in any of your systems, who is responsible for gathering it and making it actionable, making it useful? That is very, very key. When you're looking at any of the processes the systems that you use to help employees do their job, who's responsible for that system and, and for making sure that it's updated and communicated
throughout your credit union. And then once you have the information, you create a focus strategy. So in this case, I've very simply looked at, at data and analytics, and I've used that system because that's what I've got expertise in, and created four simple strategies. High value members, migrating how high value member lookalikes, optimized mortgage prospecting and coaching small businesses for success. So you take the output from your systems and you roll it into some simple strategies or some simple action steps. You don't want to make this too complicated. So we're winding down here. What have we discussed? We talked about creating a high velocity credit union. And we went through three components. We, we looked at leadership, people, and systems. And we said leadership is responsible for direction, creating clear direction. And we talked about the six guiding forces of credit union growth. And in that context, the most important slide that you saw today was the playing field, the eight pillars of strategic alignment. Next, we talked about people. We talked about job performance, strengths, uh, overhauling processes, high value actions, and uh, incentives, unleashing your thought leaders, and that creates speed around the, the, the clear direction that leaders give. And then we talked about systems using strategic marketing as a way to look at a system. And you've got many systems in your, in your credit union. You, you prioritize which ones are most important to you right now going forward into 2017 and, and look at, at those systems and see if they need to be overhauled and see if they need to be realigned into your strategic thinking. So we talked about thinking and acting like a champion. These are the things that champions do, that champion organizations do. It's hard. It's really hard. It's hard to be a champion. Don't you think it's hard to be Michael Phelps? I was wondering if he's going to go for another Olympics. It's hard. But this separates average from good to excellent. Thinking and acting like a champion. It takes passion. It takes persistence. You're not going to get there overnight. You've got to believe in this. You've got to work together as a board and an executive management. It takes humility. Because you've got to think, I've been doing this the same way. It works, but maybe there is a better way. There probably is. And so, what I'd like to see you do is to take this back to your next board meeting and review it and say, what do we learn here? Are there any things that we can adopt in our credit union? How can, our, our, how can we create a higher velocity credit union? How can management be clearer in their direction? How can employees be more effective and efficient, and how can our systems help propel us forward going into the future. So I really appreciate your time here, uh, and it's been great to be in, in Coeur d'Alene. Thanks so much.